We're having quite a time. I remind myself of a calf about six, seven hundred pounds on the end of a rope when the spirit comes that's been stall fed and feeling good in the sunshine. <laughs> this thing on me. <laughs> Heard Boney Fleming preaching one night with one of these on and the spirit came. He said, my Lord, somebody get me loose. I've got to shout. Almost heaven, Mount of Praise, camp meeting, Circleville, Ohio. I appreciate the atmosphere, don't you? Amen. I'm glad the Lord is here, and we sense his presence in a marvelous way. I said to Brother Humble when I came onto the platform, if I had my rathers, Brother Dorsey would preach this afternoon. Number one, because I appreciate his ministry, Number two, because it's powerful hot up here. <laughs> and I notice when people get hot and full, it's hard to keep them awake. <clears throat> if you'll excuse me, I'll unbutton this corset that I've got on. <laughs> then maybe I won't choke myself on this wire. <clears throat> Will you stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word? Chapter 37 of the book of Psalms, verses 35, 36, and 37 of the 37th division of the Psalms. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yet I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Our Father, we thank Thee for the Word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. We appreciate the great song service and the fact that You live this afternoon. And because You live, we too live also. Blessed be God. We're grateful for the presence and the power and the demonstration of the Spirit of God. Now, our Father, we ask thy continued blessing and anointing upon your unworthy servant as once again we stand in this sacred place. We ask, our Father, that thou shalt touch our finite mind, that we shall be able to concentrate intelligently, and our voice that we shall be able to speak distinctly. We pray that Thou shalt awaken every one of us to the truths of Thy Word. Help us not to become weary or drowsy in this service, but glorifying the matchless Son of God by our attention and obedience to the Holy Spirit. If there be a needy heart in this congregation this afternoon, might they realize that their need can be supplied through Thee. Defeat every plan, purpose, and power of the enemy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We'd like to direct your thinking for just a few moments this afternoon to verse 37 of this 37th division of the Psalms of which we read three verses in your hearing. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright... For the end of that man is peace. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright. For the end of that man is peace. Under direction of the Holy Spirit for just a few moments, we would like to talk to you about the righteous man or woman, New Testament and Old Testament. I appreciate the fact that God has provided a plan whereby we can be restored to our rightful relationship with the Holy God. Aren't you glad for that this afternoon? We find that David is not speaking in regards to the self-righteous man. And I realize that there is none righteous but God himself. But I'm speaking of the man who has been forgiven 
of his transgression, who has been pardoned of his sin, who has been filled with the Spirit and is living above sin. I'm happy that this is possible, yet even in this space age in which we're living. Many folk, beloved, hesitate to call themselves righteous as others hesitate to call them saints, but they're only the righteous and the unrighteous. They're only the saint and the sinner, the lost and the saved. And I certainly would rather be called saved than lost and would rather be saved than lost, would rather be righteous than unrighteous, would rather be holy than unholy, and here in this passage of Scripture, the 37th Psalm, we find that David is giving to us a very beautiful picture, as I said, both a New Testament righteous man and an Old Testament righteous man. Notice with me as you follow down throughout this 37th division of the Psalms, beginning with verse 16, that the first thing that David declares in regards to the righteous man is the fact that his little is blessed of God. Read with me, if you will, verse 16. For David there declares a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many. Now, down our way, we would say it this way. You better have a little bit with the blessing of God upon it than to have a lot without the blessing of God upon it. One poet said, houses and lands I may not own, wealth or riches to be known. Little person in this world I may be, can't keep up with the times, but thank God I'm doing fine since I claim Jesus first. That's enough for me. Oh, how precious is His grace when you know the time and place, when you quit this world of sin down on your knees. Once he caught my fallen soul, now it's better felt than told. I claim Jesus first, and that's enough for me. I believe this is vividly portrayed in the first book of Kings, chapter 17. Now I read in verse 1 that Elijah the Tishbite had prayed that it might not rain, and there was no rain. You know the results of no rain is a drought, and the results of a drought is a famine. But God said, Elijah, I've made provision for you. There's a stream over here called the stream of Chanath. You go over there and pitch your tent or set up camp there by the stream. I'll feed you on bread and meat in the morning. Glory to God, and I'll feed you on bread and meat in the evening, and you can drink water from the brook and be sustained. My brother, you couldn't beat that in time of drought. I can remember we had beans. Somebody said, don't you like beans? I said, I got foundered on them in depression times. We had beans one time and taters the next time, and I still don't care too much for soup beans yet today, but during this time of depression, God provided the prophet Elijah with bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and fresh water from the brook. But notice with me, there came a time when the brook dried up too. We're living in a day, children, when a lot of brooks are drying up. But I'm glad that God's children don't have to dry up just because of the fact that some brooks are drying up. A fella said to me the other day, oh, preacher, these things are bound to come. This is the sign of the end of time. I said, I know that. And we were talking about a great falling away and, and a losing 
losing of the fire and the power and the glory, but I said it's going to come without you and I helping fulfill prophecy by going dead in our own heart and in our own soul. I'm happy that if you want to stay watered, God will provide a place for you to drink and something to eat. And everything seems to be drying up. Thank God you can be fat in your soul and satisfied on the things of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. So God said, Elijah, I've made arrangements with a widow woman that lives over at Zarephath with her son, and you're going to stay over there. I'm glad that happened then and not now, or the holiness people would have wagged their heads off and their tongues too, wouldn't they? Uh, I see some of you sperm, and you've been a running your tongue too. But he said, go on over there, Elijah. I have made arrangements. And when Elijah got over near the gate of the village, the Lord said, that's her over there picking up sticks. Go over and ask her to bake you a cake. So I can see the old prophet as he goes over and introduces himself and says, I would like for you to bake me a cake. And she said, but sir, I only have just enough oil in the cruise and enough meal in the barrels to bake a cake for my son and myself, and then that'll be the end for us. But he insisted that she bake him a cake, so she was obedient to the man of God and started to bake the cake. And as she went, he called out, and would you fee please fetch me a drink of water, a mighty scarce article too. But in a little bit, she came back with the cake and with the water and the man of God gave thanks not only to her, but to Almighty God. And then he said, you go back and bake a cake for your son and for yourself. And children, much to her surprise, when she peered down in the barrel, there was just as much meal in there as there had been to start with. And she tipped up the cruise, and there was just as much oil in there as there had been to start with. And the Word tells me... That that as long as the drought was on, that the meal never wasted away, and the crews never went dry, because a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. I say hallelujah. Glory to God, I'm about to get worked up. Hallelujah. Little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. I could go on and give you account after account how God has provided. I remember one time when I was in school, I needed just $75 to finish paying for my books and tuition for that semester. We were on our way, or we were in revival. We we're getting ready to leave, and a lady called. She said, I understand you're in revival. I said, that's right. She said, would you have a few minutes to stop by the house? I said, okay. Is there something wrong? I've got to talk to you. We stopped by the house, and she said, while I was praying this morning, the Lord told me to write you a check for $25. I said, I appreciate that. That was one-third of all that I owed in my life. She wrote the check out for $25, and I said, Now, we have to be on our way. Let's pray before we go. And I knelt there in the living room. My wife knelt. She knelt on the other side of my wife. She was a great saint of God. And I'll tell you all, heaven opened up, kids. And the glory of the Lord came down. And when I stood up, she shouted all over the house, in through the kitchen and back past me. And I had the check in my hand. And Brother Dorsey, she grabbed it out of my hand and tore it into shreds and threw it all over her beautiful living room. The devil said, you had it, but it's gone now. Brother, it was gone. I couldn't have pasted it back together had I tried. She said, now, if you've got just one minute, I've got to be obedient to the Lord. When I made that check out this afternoon, the Lord told me to make it for $75, and I sort of cheated on the Lord. I made it for just a third of the amount. I said, Sister, God knew exactly to the penny how much I owed. And Paul said, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. 
I remember one time I only had 50 cents to my name. Got up on Monday morning, my wife said, I don't have anything in the house, honey, to fix for your bucket to take to school this morning. I, she said, have you got any money? I said, I got 50 cents. But I said, I wanted to go hear the G.I.s of the cross tonight from God's Bible School over at Cincinnati. And I, we had a Model A Ford then. That reminded me of that when Brother Dorsey was speaking of the Model T. We had a Model A Ford. Man, you could travel a long ways on 50 cents then. And I went to school that morning and had classes. And uh, we fellows that were studying for the ministry always met out on the campus under the trees in the fall of the year and ate lunch together. And then after that, we'd go over to the co-op store and get us a great big ice cream cone. Man, you could get a big one for a dime then. You can't get a big one for 55 cents now. <laughs> Somebody went in we were with the other day and bought us four ice cream cones. Said, you know how much that cost? I, I said, have no idea. He said, $2.20 for four ice cream cones. Man, we got a big one for a dime. Anyhow, that day at noon, I didn't eat. They said, come on over, my boy. I said, I'm not going to eat anything today. What's the matter? I didn't want them to know, and I didn't tell them. And then after they'd finished, they, I just read and read and read and read. And after they'd finished, they said, come on, let's go over to the store. Get us an ice cream cone like we do. I said, I ain't going today. I ain't going today. I got home that night, man, I'll tell you, I felt like my belly was gnawing on my backbone. My wife handed me a letter. And I opened the letter and it said, Dear brother and sister, greetings in the lovely name of Jesus. Perhaps you won't remember me, but last Sunday night, we were passing your church on State Route 50. You were in revival. We saw all the cars around. I live up on Lake Erie. She said, I came in and God got hold of my heart. And I was one of the 20-some that bowed at the altar last Sunday night. God, for Christ's sake, pardon me of my transgression. And when I got up this morning, the Spirit said, send you a $5 bill. And it fell out of the envelope. And man, I'll tell you, when I pulled into the filling station that night, I didn't say, give me 50 cents worth, bud. I said, fill her up and you'd have thought I was a millionaire a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked and I appreciate the provisions I could go on and I'm sure these other fellows could tell of time after time of God filling your gas tank and paying insurance premiums and putting bread on the table and shoes on the kids and clothes on your back aren't you glad for the goodness of God isn't he good to us this afternoon I think we ought to give him praise don't you for all all that is done for us. Hallelujah. Then another thing that I want to call your attention in regards to the righteous man is the fact that he is upheld by the Lord. He is upheld by the Lord. You remember here in this particular passage of Scripture, David declares the Lord in verse 17, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. Say, feller, it's good to have someone come around you in time of trouble and say, the Lord bless you. We're in back of you. But there's something better than that. And that is when sin and sickness and sorrow and death and tragedy and misunderstanding have a tendency to pull us down. It's better to know that there's someone, thank God, who can get underneath you with his ever everlasting arms and lift you up above the shadows where the sun shines and the blessing of the Lord can be sensed. I remember, I believe it was Brother Sammy Sparks of hearing him tell one time how he was flying from the state of California to Michigan for revival meeting. And he said, as we flew over the plains of Texas, we encountered one of the most terrific storms that I've ever flown through. And he said, I was seated beside an officer of the Navy who turned to me and said, Reverend, do you think we'll make it through the storm? He said, oh, yes. I have an appointment tomorrow evening to preach second blessing of holiness in such and such a place. And I believe God will keep this thing in the air safely until we arrive at our destination. He said that was at night. And he said about that time I felt that plane begin to climb and climb and climbed. And they climbed several hundred more feet than they had already been. And he said all at once I looked up and there the moon seemed to be smiling down upon us. I looked below and the lightning was playing upon the billowing clouds and the stars were twinkling in their places what had happened they had climbed above the 
the storm. Father, I'm glad that there are everlasting arms that can get underneath us during times of trial and test and misunderstanding and lift us up above the storm where the sun shines and the glory rolls and the blessing of God can be enjoyed. I say hallelujah. You remember Moses was an old man. His hair had blossomed for eternity. His shoulders were stooped. The lines of his brow had been deepened by the plows of time. And he called the children of Israel together. And he said, folk, I'm going to be leaving you before long. But there's one thing I want you to remember above all others. And that is the fact that the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. The poet said, sometimes on the rock I tremble. Faint of heart and weak of knee, but the blessed rock of ages never trembles under me. Aren't you glad for those everlasting arms? God said to Isaiah, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Here it is now. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And when thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. And through the rivers, thank God, they shall not overflow thee. The righteous are upheld by the Lord. Aren't you glad for that this afternoon? I'll tell you folks, I couldn't make it. I'd have sunk a long time ago. But as the poet said, when I think I'm going to sink, I hold my hand up high. That great big hand of God's comes down and takes a hold of mine. Aren't you glad that he lifts you up this afternoon? Thank God forevermore. Then, beloved, the righteous have an everlasting inheritance. I never inherited anything but one thing in my life. It wasn't too much and wasn't with me long. But I appreciated it. I didn't deserve that. I know a fellow that inherited $270,000, and in two years' time, he'd blown it all. Women and whiskey and automobiles. Gone! But David tells us that the righteous have an everlasting inheritance. Verse 18, the Lord knoweth the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. He may have little on this earth, but thank God if he's a child of the king, he has an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven, and can sing, I once was an outcast. Stranger on earth, sinner by choice, and an alien by birth. But say, I've been adopted. Glory be to God. My name's written down an heir, an heir. Did you hear what I said? An heir to a mansion, a robe, and a crown. Then the righteous man, and I've got to hurry on, the righteous man is gracious and merciful, and I certainly appreciated the message of Brother Dorsey along these lines this morning. You know, we're living in a day when folk, some folks, some religious folks, some, even some professed homeless people can get pretty nasty if you don't agree with them on everything. Now, here I go off on a tangent. Dear Lord, help me. I don't want you to misunderstand me. We ought to have standards. Hmm? We ought to have convictions, and we ought to live our convictions and not try to cram them down somebody else's throat. Huh? There are some things that we must all agree on to be Christian. There are other things that are minor, and I can't see where it makes too much difference. Hmm? I think everybody who is a Christian will dress modestly. I, I guess I'm a little old-fashioned along that line. I, I remember when folks dressed different than they dress today, and some of it I liked a whole lot better than I do today. I'll be honest with you. Huh? Hardest thing in the world for me to get used to seeing a woman have shorter hair than mine. And it's even harder... For me to see a woman wear breeches to meeting. 
Now, some of you waller that around for a while and maybe spit it at me when I go out. Huh? I ain't going to fuss with you over it. No, I said I just like to see the things like they used to be something. We've made a lot of improvements. And we've made a lot of other changes that ain't been so hot, too, I'll tell you that. Huh? Come on now. Somebody says, he's a crank. No, he ain't no crank. I'm not arguing with you. Hmm? Paul spoke to the Corinthian church in regards to the ladies' hair, and he said it was their glory, but he said if there be any contention, we ain't going to fuss with you about it. Keep a shaking that thing up and down this way now. Amen. But you know, we can become pretty uncharitable over these things sometimes. We can get pretty nasty. Hmm. We just kind of curl up her nose and give them a cold shoulder and after we're gone from them a little ways, a little hot tongue along with the cold shoulder. Hmm? Help us, Jesus. I remember one time, the first, one of the first revivals we were ever in, a couple other boys and myself, we were all just kids, were taking night about preaching and one night in the service, uh, one of the boys said something about tobacco. We were staying with a fellow that chawed the backer. And we had to work for our board. They had horses, and we either plowed or drug ground, get ready to plant corn. And church didn't start till 9 o'clock at night. And after everybody got their work done, while they come to meeting, house was full. We didn't care if it was out 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. We just went to have church, went home when it was over with. House was packed every night. Somebody said something about the tobacco, and he came to me, and he said, I don't like what he said about my chewing. I said, well, why don't you quit? <laughs> I didn't know any better, you know. He said, well, now, bud, I want to tell you something. He took out a little old pinch of tobacco about like that out of the red horse sack and stuck it down here. He said, that settles my stomach just like a tum after I eat. Well, I didn't argue with him. We just went on, went to the field, and done the work. And the next day, noon, we came in, and his wife had prepared great chicken dinner. Man, she had everything that went with it. And then dessert, pie, cake, fruit salad, everything imaginable. And he just sat there and stuffed himself. And we started, <laughs> we started back to the field after dinner. Got around in front of the barn, and it was a driveway through the barn, and he took him out a little chaw and stuffed it down in his jaw there. And wallowed around a little bit, and spit once or twice, and went on. Got around behind the barn, and I was right behind him. And there laid an old, dead, white, leggern hen with the maggots working all over her. And brother, he stopped and gagged, and the chicken and the dumplings and the mashed potatoes and the pie and the cake all come up. Now, I know that ain't nice to talk about that, but I got a point. <laughs> and I couldn't help but say it, Brother Ben. I said your chaw never helped settle your stomach then. But the thing I want to tell you is this. Twenty years later, he moved into the community where I was pastoring, and he quit in the meantime, but he moved into this community, he came to church, and a fellow just went to the altar, and he still smoked. And he said, Reverend, he can't be a Christian and smoke. I said, you was and you chewed, and I don't see the difference. Let's be consistent. I said, you lay off of him and pray for him and quit talking about him. You're getting it, ain't you? You understand what I mean, don't you? We ought to be gracious and merciful. The righteous are. My wife, I, I'm, I'm real concerned about her. You know, you can tell when somebody loses the glory the Spirit of God and gets that critical, nasty, non-spirit. One day the lady from the nursing home called and said, Mrs. So-and-so wants to see you and your wife. I went over. She looked up at me and she said, you know, I'm not going to be here long. And I want you to pray with me. I said, well, the Lord bless you. She, I started to pray and she stopped me. She said, just a minute. 
I'm not through. She said, you know, I've been nasty, and I've been mean, and I've been critical, and I, I have accused people of things, and I'm sorry, and I want you to pray that God will restore the joy of my salvation and give me that genuine peace that once I had. We prayed for quite some time, and all at once I felt her hand slip from between mine, and I heard them hit together. She said, oh, I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. The righteous are gracious and merciful. Even though everybody don't see things through your glasses, you still treat them civil. You still treat them as you, though you're a Christian. Amen. God help us this afternoon. Then another thing, my friend, that we need to be gracious and merciful is in the realm of demonstration. You know, some folk think if you don't carry on like that, carry on, you just ain't got it. Huh? And others think if you do carry on, you had not to carry on. You ought to shut up. Huh? I was calling one afternoon, I knocked on the door, and a fella came to the door, and I introduced myself, and, and he introduced himself. I said, we'd like to invite you out to our services. He said, where at? I told him. He said, I'm not coming. I said, you're not coming? You got a reason? Yes, sir. I said, anybody do anything to you from our church? No, sir. I said, what's your reason? He said, y'all are too noisy. I said, then you find you a good quiet place. You won't have any trouble finding it and get out to church next Sunday morning. I said, if you like it quiet, that's all right. We like it noisy. Don't condemn us. Huh? Come on, some of you fellas keep going this way. I think you're all going to quiet down on me. Some folk consider me demonstrative and emotional. I am, I guess, at times... But there's some things that don't even work me up in the least bit. For four years, I played a slide trombone in the band and went to every ball game around. Stood out there and tried to work that thing sometimes and it just froze up tight. Have to work with it or take it in somewhere and get it thawed out and then keep it a-going until half time so it could play again. And I was wanting our side to win. And man, I'd stand there between some of those guys and gowns. And when we made a touchdown, our side made a touchdown, they'd throw their hats in the air. They'd scream and jump and yoop and yell and holler and carry on. That was all right with me if they wanted to do that. They was getting a kick out of it. I was having a good time. I probably was enjoying myself maybe just as well as they were. But what I can't understand about it is this. You can come to church... And somebody began to sing, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And somebody gets stirred about the fact that there is open, yet in the house of David, a fountain for sin and uncleanness. And howl hollers hallelujah. Somebody says he's nuts. <laughs> Have him probated. Whereas if he did that at a ball game, he'd just be a good sports fan. Come on now. Hey Amen. And henceforth our churches have gotten deader and deader and deader and deader because we haven't died to each other and have neither been gracious or merciful in regards to one another. Help us, Jesus. If you want to go to the ball game and scream so loud on Saturday, you can't say a word on Sunday morning, that's none of my business. I feel like coming to church on Sunday morning and walking in and they begin to sing like Wall and Ginger's been a singing and something strikes me in my soul and I jump to my feet and holler, Glory be to God, you leave me alone and I'll leave you alone. How many of you can say glory? glory. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah? Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. Glory to God. Gracious and merciful. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank God. Amen. I don't know what, what time is quitting time. I ain't heard the whistle blow yet. Maybe that was it. I don't know. Ah, Lord help us. Then the last thing that I want to call your attention is the text. The end of that man is peace. Glory to God. 
He doesn't have to pray like Balaam, let me die the death of the righteous, for he has already experienced the righteousness of God Almighty. Hallelujah. Isaiah said, Hezekiah, you're going to die. Hezekiah rolled over in bed and said, Lord, you know me. Remember how I walked before you in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is right in your sight. And they couldn't pray anymore. He was ready to meet the Lord. Glory to God. Old David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. I told some of you last weekend I had trouble with my knee, and I thought I'd sprained it or bruised it. Finally, my wife got me to go to the doctor last Tuesday morning, and he said, Your blood pressure is dangerously high, and you have a blood clot in your leg. And I looked at him and grinned. He said, what are you grinning about, silly? He said, this could go to your lungs and then to your heart and you'd be gone just like that. I said, I'm supposed to preach next Saturday. He said, you get back in here next Friday morning and let me check you. Somebody said, what did he say when you got back? I said, I ain't been back yet. <laughs> Man, I've been busy. And you know, I went home and sat down by myself and I thought, now, Lord, this could be it. He might know what he's talking about. But if it is, I want to know whether everything's okay or not. And you know, all the sweet, calm confidence and assurance that flooded my soul. Just to know that it is well that I could say with the apostle, I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. But I fought a good fight, finished the course, kept the faith. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Blessed be God forevermore. I remember one night, and with this I'll try to close. We were in service. A man, son, a man whom I'd known well, came in the door, came onto the platform. He said, my dad wants to see you immediately. I said, is he sick? No. But he says he's going to heaven. I said, What's the matter with him? I don't know. He said to tell you to come now. He's going to heaven. And uh, I, I told the evangelist, I said, you fellas go ahead. I'll see what he wants. And I went over with the son, went in the house. I said, what's the matter with you, man? He said, I'm homesick. I want to go to the city. I want to see Ma. I want to see some of the kids he named them that had gone on. I said, are you sick? No, I'm just homesick. I'd like to go to heaven tonight. He's about 79 years old. He said, where's your wife? I said, she'll be here in a little bit when service is out. He said, I couldn't wait. I was afraid I might leave before I got to see you again. And I wanted to see you. I want to see her. I said, she'll be here. Half hour, 45 minutes, she came in. And he said, I want you to sing. I said, what do you want us to sing? He said, sing Zion's Hill. We sung Zion's Hill. And he got up and walked the floor. Great big man had one arm cut off in the coal mine. He said, now sing an empty mansion. We sang an empty mansion. I said, how about you singing first? He got up and... Straightened his shoulders up, walked across the floor, and he sang, I'm a poor orphan boy, all alone in this world. Take me home, dear Savior. Take me home. The tears run down his cheeks and dropped off onto his coat lapel. We stayed till about 10, 30, 11 o'clock, ate some ice cream and cake and prayed again. He said, you don't think I know what I'm talking about, do you? I said, I don't know. I believe you do. Maybe you're just a little anxious. 10, 30, we went home. We just gotten laid down in bed and the phone rang. His daughter-in-law said, can you come back quick? I think Paul's gone. I think he's gone. We got in the car, rushed back down there about four or five miles to go. The emergency squad was coming out. He said, too late, preacher, too late. He's gone. I said, he made her. He made her. He knew where he was going. <laughs> he knew where he was going. The end of that man is peace. Praise God. <laughs> Little lady from Columbus moved to our community. Came to church, I'll tell you, she was a sainted lady. Man, when she came into the church, she didn't sit down and start talking to everybody around her. She knelt between the seats. And everybody hushed up around her. I wish I had a lot more like that kneel between the seats and hush some of them up. <laughs> Sound like a bunch of Guinness before meeting starts. Hmm? Lord, help us. I said, Sister, I called her name. I said, Sister Nella, why did you move down here in this neck of the woods? She said, I was praying. 
and Albert's never been a Christian. And the Lord told me if I'd move down here that Albert would get saved. Whoop, glory to God, she said. I said, he's going to. I went to him. I talked to him. I seen he wasn't going to be pushed. And I said, if ever I can help you get to God, I want you to call me. One night I stopped at my dad's New Year's Eve. And man, it was after midnight. said, Mrs. So-and-so called, calling for you. And I said, I'll go by the house. I'm sure they're in bed. And went by the house and the lights were all out. The next day there was a lady here in this tabernacle this afternoon. We called. We went over. He said, you know, preacher, you told me if I ever got ready to seek God to let you know. He said, I'm ready. And his chin began to quiver and the tears rolled down his cheeks. And his wife began to shout. <laughs> He said, you know, I quit all my dirty habits. He went on, named a lot of things to quit. He said, all I need is Jesus. All I need is Jesus. He said, if you're ready, I'm ready. He got up and knelt by that old rocking chair. Brother, he prayed a little while, and the other two or three of us there prayed. And all at once, we didn't have to tickle him under the chin and tell him to take it by faith and believe. He had it. He got up, his hands in the air, the tears dripping off his cheek. He said, for the first time in my life, I'm saved. I'm saved. He came to church the next Sunday morning and it was a little embarrassing to me. First time him being there and couldn't find a place to sit and he had to sit way back in the back. I said, Albert, testify. He got up and I'll tell you the glory of God was all over him. I think it was the next day he sat down in the chair that he'd gotten saved by, slumped over and was gone. Just made it in time. But the end of that man was peace. The poet said, when peace like a river attendeth my way, oh glory, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, <laughs> it is well with my soul, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well. It is well with my soul. I told you I felt like a six or eight hundred pound calf on the end of a rope that had just got out of the stall. Glory to God forevermore. Isn't it great to know that the end can be peace? Thank God. And it's greater to know that the present can be peace. Will you stand with me? I wonder if we might sing that great hymn, Wally, when peace like a river. Do you know that? It is well with my soul. I wonder if we might sing that. I wonder before we sing, with every head bowed and every eye closed, how many of you can say, Preacher, if I know my heart and I know my mind, Jesus saves me, He sanctifies me, it is well with my soul. Would you testify by the upraised hand? Why you got it up there, can I hear you say, thank you, Jesus? Oh, hallelujah. I wonder, you may take them down. I wonder how many of you can say, preacher, I'm saved. But I'm not sanctified. Will you pray for me? My heart's hungry. I feel like I've got to go deeper before I can go farther. I need heart holiness. Will you pray for me? Amen. May I see your hand slip it up. One, two, three, four. Is there another? Five. I see that. God bless you. May take them down. Is there another? Amen. Amen. I wonder if there's a one of you before we pray and then sing. I'd like to say, and I'm not going to put the pressure on you. I know it's hot and you're tired. I wonder if there's a one of you who'll say, Preacher, my heart's so hungry. I'd like to come and let God sanctify me right now. Would you do it? Would you die to sin and die to self? Hey man, make the surrender complete as old E.A. Curry used to say, die, die like a yaller dog under the kitchen porch. Let the Holy Ghost move in and set up housekeeping within your soul. Would you like to come? Hey Amen. Blessed God, we thank you for the presence, the power of the Spirit of God. Use the broken remarks that have fallen from stammering lips to your glory. Bless these precious souls that are unsanctified, O oh God. Intensify the hunger and the thirst after the fullness and the righteousness of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing it out. If it's not well, 
we invite you to come to the mercy seat. Like a river attend my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to see. It is will, it is. Now if it is, testify while you sing that chorus with the uplifted hand. With my soul, it is well, it is well, with my soul. Let's sing that verse, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. Sing it out, my sin. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my, sing it now. It is well. My soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. I want us to sing one verse. One young lady has come, one verse of just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. One verse, if no other response, you've closed the invitation. Here's another young lady over here. Oh God, help us. If I didn't know that the end would peace, be peace, you'd have a seeker this afternoon. Will you settle with God? Will you settle with God, my friend? Oh, Lamb of God. Sing another verse, Tony. Sing another verse. Holy Ghost, help us here. Help us, Lord. As long as you respond, we'll sing. Will you mind, God? What about those of you out on the grounds outside the tabernacle? Do you have peace with God? Because I promise, I believe, Lamb of God. Did any come that time or not? I did any come that time or not? I don't know. Sing it one more time, Molly. One more time. We gotta sing it again. One lady came. I've gotta be true to my word. Sing her again. Holy Ghost, help us. Sing it again. Holy 
Ghost, help us. Oh, God, help us. Have broken every barrier down now to be thine. Yeah, thine alone. Amen. Doesn't take long if you mean business. Praise the Lord. All right, some of you brethren and sisters gathered in with these that are praying. Come right on, church. God bless your heart. Whether you know them or not, they need help. They need your prayer and encouragement and admonition. Come right on. God bless your heart. Let's get a hold of the Lord. Amen. Amen.